The last question for today on our one-hour Strengths Free Lounge is, uh, Chris Taylor says, if you could make a planetarium show again, what would it be about, and how would you do it differently now that you're older and hopefully wiser? I thought about that. I thought, oh, I don't know. Everything I want to do has been done. And then I realized, oh, hang on here, Jason. Uh, the uh, There's something that I've been just watching endlessly on YouTube. I've talked about this uh, before. There's a, my favorite YouTube video, of, I think, of all time is um, it's called Imagining the Tenth Dimension. It's by a guy named Rob. I cannot remember. I can't believe I forgot his name. I know it's going to come up in a second, but i got to do it because I just think so highly of the guy here in a second. Rob Bryanton. Um, he's, he's got this, um, he's got this, uh, <coughs> movie that I saw, uh, a YouTube movie, 10 minute, 11 minute movie called Imagining the Tenth Dimension. And I was always interested in these kind of things, so I just watched it. And as I've said before, watching it the first time, I felt like a dog watching TV. And then I watched it again and again and again. The more I watched it, the more it made sense. His idea is that the dimensions are stacked one on top of the other, each other, but and we do believe that there are 11 dimensions, and, and Rob's theory is that there are dimensions, and he explains the kind of symmetry of it, and there's a st one stage, second stage, third stage, and at the end of that stage, you shrink that down to a point, and then you get a second, third, and fourth, shrink that down to a point, you get a second, third, and fourth, so it's threes of threes. Um, and after I saw that, I thought, oh, well, that's really interesting. Then he did then he did one on imagining the first dimension, imagining the second, took a look at each one of the dimensions um, in in order. And then I found out that he's got something like 80, 90, 100 videos talking about all kinds of really weird stuff. But um, but the more I watch him and the more I think about it, the more I think he's right. Now, many uh, physicists have said he's completely nuts, but we're, when you start dealing with these kind of things, you're so far out there. He's got plenty of experimental evidence that does back him up, and people are kind of drifting his way. Uh, but here's the thing about, about the theory that, that Rob has put out. It's so elegant, it's so elegant that I suspect it has to be true. Usually when you find something that simple, it almost has to be true. And he's, his explanation for higher dimensions is so astonishingly simple, it's so clean, and appears to be working in terms of predictability, that I think he's right. So I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but I will. I have been wanting to find an excuse to talk about this. So let me just tell you what what I've come to believe is is it. You're going to have to, I'm going to have to just backtrack a little bit here, but but here's the basics. So um, Rob Bryanton maintains that we are not three-dimensional creatures, that we're actually fifth-dimensional creatures. And here's how it works. Um, he, well, see, this is why the guy is so brilliant. He's absolutely just genius. Um, here is a, an iPhone, right? And how many dimensions does this phone have? Everybody says, well, it's a three-dimensional object. It has three dimensions. No. It's a four-dimensional object. This is the insight that, that Rob has given me by just constantly hammering it home. This is not a three-dimensional object. It's a four-dimensional object because the proportions, the, the dimensions of this object are it has length, it has width, it has height, and it has duration. It has duration. It exists through time. And time is not a dimension. Time is a direction that we travel through the fourth dimension. That we are moving through the fourth dimension, which is just a physical dimension of space. This is the thing that I think is so elegant about this theory. He's not saying it's three dimensions plus this weird dimension called time, because time doesn't make any sense. We are moving in a one-way street down the fourth dimension called time. We can't see it. It's at right angles to the other three dimensions. You can draw pictures of things that look like they're at right angles to the other three dimensions, and you can see a four-dimensional cube rotating on itself, which just does these weird twists, and it's just enough to give you that kind of dog-watching TV sense of something that is literally unimaginable, which is the fourth dimension. We can't picture it, but we can we can explore it, and, and since we can explore it, we know things like, if you look at two-dimensional people, if you had a two-dimensional person, Looking down on Flatlanders, you could see that if they went into, if there was a square, right, uh, and there, there's a two-dimensional person on one side, and then there's a square on the other, and there's a two-dimensional person on the other side, they can't see each other because they can't see through the square. Well, in three dimensions, we can see around the square. We're above the square, so we can see around the square. 
in the same way somebody in the fourth dimension watching our three dimensions would be able to see the inside and the outside of a building at the same time. They'd be able to see the inside and the outside of you at the same time. So we're moving through the fourth dimension, which is a spatial dimension at the speed of one second per second. And he talks about Planck time. Planck time is the smallest unit of time. Um, it's the time it takes for a, a, a photon of light to cross a hydrogen atom. And I forget what the number is, but needless to say, it's a trillion, 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 trillionth of a second. But what's interesting about Planck time is as we get into uh, quantum mechanics, we find out that there's one frame of Planck time, and then there's another frame of Planck time, but nothing in between. In other words, you can't dice that up. You can't have a half a Planck time. It's one, and then it's the other, but there's nothing in between. It just doesn't work. It stops. So what Rob is basically saying is that we're living our lives in one Planck time of three-dimensional time per second, and every single second that comes by, another Planck time of three-dimensional space comes up. Now, he believes in the multi-universe theory, and I've come to believe it too. So here's why we're fifth dimensional objects. He says that if you can imagine ourselves in the fourth dimension, for example, you've seen me here in the office. Let's imagine I'm walking behind me in the studio. What we see now of me is a three-dimensional cross-section of my four-dimensional being because I have length, width, depth, and duration. I, you can see how tall I am. You can see how deep I am. You can see how wide I am. But you can't see my duration. This is, the, this is the dimension that we can't see. And so as we move through this physical fourth dimension, all we get are something that looks like time. It's change. We can see here's five fingers and here's one finger. And look, it's changed. But what this theory is, and I believe this theory, is that there is a, a spline. It's like a, a snake of, of my, all of my three-dimensional motions. And there was a period there where there were five of them. And then further down the thing, it went down to one of them. And, and if you think about me walking around this studio, just think of a giant snake that's an outline of everywhere I've been, but instead of me walking into myself, the reason I don't is because if I were to walk over to there and back, there'd be a, 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 an undulating snake that looked like me, if you could see it in fourth dimensions, but the reason it wouldn't hit itself is because while I run to the studio and back in a straight line in three dimensions, I've actually moved through the fourth dimension of time. The duration has changed. So time is there to make sure that things don't happen all at once. But time is not real. T this is the thing. Of all the things I would try to get you to believe is that there's no such thing as time. Time does not exist. Time is a, is a limit of our perception of the fourth dimension as we move through it. So why aren't we four-dimensional creatures? This is the thing I think is so brilliant about him, and I'm not going to get into the higher dimensions, but five is really fascinating. Um, so um, here's the thing. If, if, if we don't have any free will, then life is, life is four dimensions. If we don't have any free will, free will then uh, we, we go down through this timeline in the fourth dimension, and... Um, and as we go down this timeline, everything's already there. There's no before and after. It's built. And it's just the, it's the beginning and the end, and everything's predetermined and everything else. His point is that we do have the ability to make um, we do have the ability to make conscious choice, that random chance actions of others and our own decisions change what happens. And every time we change what happens, a different universe splits off, which is based on the fact that whenever we look at something, we observe it, we collapse its probability wave. If you, if you observe something, it has to make a decision. In the quantum level, uh, unobserved uh, phenomenon exist in a state of both, and when you observe them, they literally have to make a decision because you observe them. So w the reason he says we're a fifth dimensional creature is because even though we're four dimensional creatures, three dimensional creatures moving through the fourth dimension, we have the ability to make a change, and since we can change, that actually ships that fourth dimensional uh, timeline into the fifth dimension. So I think it's compelling. I think it's a compelling argument. Basically what he's saying is we're five-dimensional creatures. We live in a three-dimensional universe that's moving through the fourth dimension in a direction called time. And because we're able to make decisions, we're able to alter that fourth-dimensional timeline, which is fifth dimension. I don't know. I think that's just bloody fascinating. I really do. And um, you know, when you get into things like super string theory, the idea is that uh, is, is that all of these things are included. Now, uh, T.G. Gecko here has said that he has uh, nothing but disdain for pop culture uh, scientists, and he says waveform collapse has nothing to do with human consciousness. 
but it does have to do with being observed, right? I mean, making the observation does it. You've got these two particles. They did an experiment not too long ago in Europe where they um, they had these uh, entangled, um, uh, what are they, quarks, I guess? entangled particles and they measured one and, and the other one changed and they don't know how fast it was they suspect it was instantaneous they know it was faster than 17 was it 17,000 times faster than the speed of light they're able to measure it you know we have very sophisticated instrumentation when you turn on a camera and and look at a result then um then you you get you get a different result than you would if there was nobody observing it Th i think there's no question that observing affects the outcome of of things and and this is it i think this is the thing that's so fascinating to me this idea is that um well he says the instrumentation the observation has to do with the instruments not the brains well what made the instruments the brains made the instruments it's an absurd absurd it's an absurd thing to say of course the instruments were made by brains and consciousness i don't pretend to think that you can see an individual quark and i don't pretend to think that you can with your own eyes take a look at whether two enmeshed particles are changing their polarity based on the observation but the fact is that we do have instrumentation that shows that when you observe something you change it you compress the waveform and those instruments were made by consciousness so we are in fact observing it through our instruments it's the, the to say the instruments are, are doing it is 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 ridiculous the instruments are not they're not actively shooting out a beam or something I mean, this is fairly this is fairly solid ground as far as quantum is concerned the idea that observation changes the outcome. This is the entire idea of Schrodinger's cat, right? Is it the cat in a box, a 50-50 chance of being alive or dead? This is the macro version of, of the quantum, the way to explain quantum, is to say that the cat is neither alive nor dead until you open the box. And when you open the box, reality has to make a decision. So um, this is substantial. This substantiated. It's... it's uh, it's just proven. And so where do you go with all this stuff? You know, this guy is not saying that, um, he's not saying that this is, is, what am I trying to say here? Rob Bryanton is not saying that his theory is uh, something that is experimentally proven to form a, a picture of the universe. What he's saying is, that everything that we observe can be explained by this theory of his and that his theory is consistent and I think it is consistent. We talk about the missing matter in the universe, he, the reason that these two, well for example these two enmeshed particles, one can be here, the other one can be on the other side of the universe. You observe it here, the other one changes instantly. It goes faster than the speed of light. Nothing is allowed to go faster than the speed of light. Rob says the reason it doesn't go faster than the speed of light is because these particles are actually touching each other in a higher dimension. And um, this is compelling to me. And the elegance of it is compelling to me and the 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 just the, the the vision of it is compelling but i will tell you this if if nothing else um i think you know you're, you're coming off like you know this whole thing's a bunch of hooey but you would have to admit that most scientists albert einstein especially and inclusively said um time is just an illusion it's a he said it's um it's a, a convenient way of expressing things in the real world but there's no there's no evidence that time exists outside of the rest of the universe as a special kind of a event or force. I mean, it's a it's an illusion, and I think anybody who's looking at these things on that lower level says that this is is true. So, if nothing else, reading and watching these Rob uh, Bryanton things have gotten me in the habit of of getting away from time, from starting to think in a in a timeless way. A timeless way means there is no before and after. It's almost impossible for us to conceive of, but it's. But I believe it's true. And I believe the evidence backs it up. Look, the reason I believe this stuff is because the evidence. I don't go running around listening to YouTube nuts who um, have some theory that doesn't make any sense. The thing is internally consistent. It's extremely logical. It's extremely elegant. There's nothing that has been discovered that is, that is against this particular theory, and it explains a lot of things. It explains a lot of... Uh, of things in a very elegant, predictable way. I think it's profound. Um, I think it's just profound. And I've been studying astronomy, cosmology, quantum since I was, you know, 13. Now, I'm not a quantum physicist, but I think 
I think a quantum physicist is looking at what he's got to do in a quantum physics laboratory. What 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 Rob is doing is just what Rob is doing is he's doing a thought experiment in the same way that um, that Albert Einstein does a thought experiment. Where Einstein says, if I'm in an elevator traveling upward in space at one g, how is that different than being on a on a flat plane at, at in a gravity field? Einstein asks questions like, if you're traveling on the speed of light and you turn on a flashlight, what would happen? What would you see? These are thought experiments, and they can teach us an awful lot. And and Rob's thought experiments are, are they're just profound. Uh, th- there's a he there's a book he quotes. He didn't come up with this, and he basically says that actually, when you think about it, um, zero is the is the most um, zero is the most powerful number. Rather than being nothing, zero mathematically encompasses everything. Because if you think about it. We think about zero as being the smallest zero. It's a nothing, and it's one, two, three, four, five, and going backwards, it's you know one hundred ninety-nine, ten ninety-seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And zero is the it's all. It's the nothing. It's the point. But on a timeline, beyond zero is negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, so on, so on, all the way out to negative infinity. You've got an infinite number of numbers one way. You've got infinite numbers the other way. And zero is the number that encompasses all of them because what he's basically saying is. If you have zero, it encompasses all of the possible numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. If you want to make it easier to understand, from negative 10 to positive 10, all of the numbers are in there balanced out to equal zero. And if you take zero and you subtract one, you're left with negative one. If you subtract five, you're left with negative five. In a sense, those numbers were inside the zero as a reference point. And if if zero encompasses everything, then I mean it's great. It's just it's it's just it, look. Like I said, I've been studying this stuff my whole life, my entire life. It's been a real hobby for me, history and and this kind of physics. And the more of this I watch, the the more profoundly uh, aware of things I become. The more consistent this seems to be, uh, and. The more I think about things, and the more I like, the more the more I believe it's true. I believe it's true, and um, and just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea of the level of thinking that this guy does, that I think is profound. Just stick with me for this on one second, because the hour's up. Just assume for a second that he's right, because I think, on some level, at least in the three, four dimensional world, I think he's absolutely right. That um, that the universe is a four-dimensional creation. It's always been there. It's always it, it'll always be there. It's it was built. You can't say by who because it was always there. What came before it? That's a ridiculous question. What's on the other side of the of it? That's another ridiculous question. You cannot um, you can't comprehend these things with these little monkey brains. But let's imagine, for example, that the that the universe is a is an object. And Rob says one of the reasons that things don't go really really badly that that the, the big catastrophes don't really happen is because he believes that gravity is the one force that moves across dimensions gravity is is what gravity is instantaneous the the the, the power of gravity is always there it's a, it's, a, it's a depression in space time but it, gravity exists faster than the speed of light there's no gravitational um Let me get get back to this. Basically, what he was saying, though, is this. He's saying, look, if you have all these multiple timelines and all these multiple universes, each one of them has mass, and, and the ones that are the ones that have the greatest mass have the greatest gravitational pull, and they're the ones that go the longest. The longest timeline is the one that's most likely, from a, from a probability view, to exist because it's, 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 it's pulling the other chance timelines towards it. You could say that um, that uh, quantum will tell you that there's a chance that I can disappear out of this chair and appear on the moon. Uh, it's a rather small chance. In fact, it is so exceedingly small that everybody agrees it would take the lifetime of many universes for it to happen. But technically, it could happen as far as the as far as this quantum um, field goes. But his point is those things don't happen because because the the gravitational pull of the likely universes pull things towards the likely. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just fantastic. It's just interesting. Um, so in any event, I really like him. 
and uh, and if I were to do a, a planetarium show, I would I would talk about this not as a scientific theory so much as uh, as a mythology. Um, Tim says, "How can gravity move across time?" You're thinking about time as as a as a flow. Time isn't a flow. Time is uh, is a direction. Time is a is a, a location. Uh, and um, I think it's I think it's marvelous. In any event, uh, I have sat there and watched um, uh, his channel is Imagining the Tenth. It's called Tenth Dimension on YouTube. He's got 60, 70 of these things. I find every single one of them to be really profound and interesting. And and uh, and as I said, I've not seen anything. Um, I've not seen anything that that struck me as this is a leap. Look, let's just assume for a second that the guy's completely wrong. It is an extremely elegant meta theory, and it is an extremely um, explanatory meta theory uh, about things that no one seems to be really talking about. And it's got mathematical, it's got a mathematical clarity to it. Um, so anyway, I think uh, if you ask me what I would do for a planetarium show, that's what I would do. I would do time as a dimension and our decisions and free will as an ability to change the fourth dimension and that we are actually five-dimensional creatures. I think it's freaking fantastic. Um, and look, there's an hour. Now I have to go back to editing. Um, 